Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net and today I'm going to talk to you about how to deal with an existential crisis. Alright, so what is an existential crisis? An existential crisis is basically where a person starts to question the meaning, value, and purpose of their life. So they want to try to find um, in light of the fact that life is ephemeral and a passing thing and that they will die one day, they want to find some kind of meaning in that. And the, the idea, the, the sort of idea is like, what's the point of it all if it's all going to go away anyway? If everything gets lost in the sands of times, what's the purpose of even being here? So that's the main idea behind what an existential crisis is. So some common symptoms of existential crisis are feeling like life has no purpose, uh, just an increased awareness of your own mortality, uh, feeling incredibly vulnerable and small in comparison to the rest of the world, uh, feeling isolated or cut off. Also feeling ungrounded and disconnected from the body is another one, uh, sort of retreating up into the mind uh, so that you don't have to deal with the unsafeness of the body. Hypochondria could be one, hypersensitivity to things that you didn't used to be sensitive about that deep feeling of emptiness and a feeling like um, your life is sort of slipping by, like trying to grab hold of water. So depending on your personality type, you might get hyper motivated and uh, try to create some kind of thing to make you feel significant. Or you might get completely paralyzed and just decide to completely click off from life. All right, so if you're currently dealing with an existential crisis or have dealt with an existential crisis in the past, you'll know that it's not really a comfortable experience. Like it can be a very depressing experience, very trying, and it really does make you question your life to the core. However, it is a very normal human experience and it is actually a sign of psychological growth. Existential crisis is sort of like a control burn. Like sometimes they'll section off a portion of the forest to burn away and that way um, in the future new things can grow from it. So it's a very destructive process but it destroys a lot of illusions so wisdom can come in its place. So an existential crisis isn't inherently bad per se but it is something that can be difficult to deal with but if you know the ways to deal with it in the most effective way it can really grow beautiful things in your life. Now, if you're the type of person uh, that's interested in expanding their awareness and to become more conscious of what's going on um, inside of you and out, uh, you're basically, you know, existential crisis is going to be um, inevitable for you. So it's going to come up. However, it doesn't necessarily need to be a struggle or an issue of suffering. You know, there are ways to actually handle uh, an existential crisis gracefully and to be able to grow from it. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the video, but in the meantime, I'll talk about my experiences with existential crisis in the past. All right, so as a child and as a teenager, I was always very obsessed with death, and I was always very aware that one day I was going to die. Actually, starting at age three, I had squished this frog, and I thought, oh, well, you know, I can just bring it back to life. I can send it to the frog hospital. But then I, I told my mom, we need to bring the frog to the frog hospital, you know, to bring it back to life. And then my mom told me, oh no, once somebody, somebody is dead, they're dead forever. And so ever since then, I've had this real acuteness of death is for, uh, acute awareness of the fact that death is forever. And so there was always this discomfort uh, looming below the surface. But as I got older and uh, went into my teen years and I started to develop an identity, there became this need to preserve that identity. And the more fine-tuned and refined that identity became, and the more seriously I took that identity, you know, the more I had to protect. I had to make that identity keep going on. I couldn't stand the idea that I would be, you know, living throughout my life and then I would die and then eventually be forgotten. So I had this idea starting at age 16 that I would become a famous artist. Like I also had aspirations to become an art teacher, but I also had this thing that after I die, not while I'm alive, but after I die, I want to become famous as an artist so that people remember my name and that people remember my work or something that I left here. I really wanted to create a legacy for myself. And, you know, below this drive, which seemed very positive, you know, probably to onlookers, seeing how motivated I was and 
how much I was into work and how focused I was. But this was really motivated by trying to outrun the Reaper, trying in some way to preserve myself. But on the flip side of this productivity, whenever I was alone, I was incredibly depressed. And I always had like these scenarios playing out in my head where I would imagine myself dying in the most lucid and most gruesome ways you could imagine. Like I would imagine myself getting into car accidents, losing limbs and what that would be like from a first person perspective. Or I would imagine what it would be like to be trapped alive underground, knowing that there was no way for you to come out but then just waiting for death to come. And so I would always have these sort of like fantasies, these negative fantasies playing out in my head. And you know, there was always this fear that no one would remember me, I wouldn't be significant. And I used to dress very uh, unusually and part of that I really enjoyed. I didn't dress like anybody else because I really didn't want to blend in with anyone. I like abhorred being associated with a group or you know, like I would hate um, at the time for people to look at a group of people and me just blend in with the rest of the people. There had to be something exceptional about me to stand out so that I could just feel significant for a little bit because in order for me to be significant, of course, there have to be others that are not significant. This also caused me to be very ungrounded for my body. Sometimes I felt barely connected to my consciousness. And there were times during my first year of college when I was 18 years old where I would be walking along on campus and it would feel like, oh, maybe my, maybe my feet aren't even really hitting the ground. I was barely aware of that. You know, it was a very uh, frail, thin awareness of my, uh, my being. So this went on until I was 20 years old. Um, and then I had tried an entheogen uh, just for recreational purposes. I, you know, I had never done any kind of psychedelic before at the time. And it immediately opened up my mind to where I could see that my trying to be significant, my trying to stand out, was a completely futile thing because you can't really add significance to yourself in any kind of existential way. You know, uh, but then there was this like deep sense of validity. Like I didn't need to justify my existence here. Like it was, I was just here and that's valid because it is what is. And what is, is what is. You know, uh, and I hope that I'm conveying this right. It wasn't that I suddenly felt significant. It was just that the idea of significance was just recognized as that. It was an idea, just a false measuring tool. And so I transcended the need for significance. And I felt completely at peace with death during that first experience for the first time since I was three years old when I found out that I was going to die one day. And so this is the main issue of having an existential crisis. It's the fact that we want ourselves and our life to be significant. We want our lives to have meaning, purpose, and value. But significance, meaning, purpose, and value are not real. They're just the measuring tools of the human mind. They are frameworks. They're not reality itself. Now, despite the fact that significance, meaning, purpose, value, having a point, any of those type of things, despite the fact that those are not real in any existential sense, they're incredibly practical tools. So basically, these are tools that we use day to day. And we've gotten so good at using those tools, we can decide what's worthwhile, what's not worthwhile, what's significant, what's insignificant, what has meaning to us, what doesn't have meaning to us. We can decide that really, really easily day by day. But there's this saying that if you carry around a hammer all day, then everything's going to start to look like a nail. Now in our case, 99% of the things that we deal with day to day are nails. And so when we ask existential questions, like what is the purpose of my life? What is the point of it all? we are now encountering a screw, you know, and you cannot hammer in a screw with a hammer. Well, I guess you could, but just for the sake of this analogy, let's say that you can. But now a screw, it looks a lot like a nail, but it works very, very differently. And so these questions you have to approach with a different set of tools but when we start to see that there's no meaning there to be had, when there's no purpose of it all, when there's no significance for it all, it's like taking a security blanket away from a child. We're so used to thinking about things in that way 
that it becomes hard for us to cope and then we start to panic and that's when an existential crisis sets in. But you see, the thing about significance and meaning is that nothing is significant, but nothing is insignificant either. So we might be tempted to say of, oh, if significance isn't real, then my life must be insignificant. But you must realize insignificant also equally not real. It's kind of like thinking like, a, let's say if you were a child with an imaginary friend and somebody tells you, hey, your imaginary friend's not real. And then you conclude, oh my God, my imaginary friend died. When the reality is that your imaginary friend has been a fabrication the whole entire time. So the trick is to really let this soak in, the fact that all of these signifiers of worth or worthlessness, significance, insignificance, meaning, meaninglessness, all of these things, we have to transcend the need for these labels because that's all they are. These things are the measuring tools of the human mind and nothing more. We have to take reality as it is if we really want to get up underneath our ideas of what's significant and what's not and to truly be at peace with our ephemeral nature. All right, so now that we know this about meaning, purpose, value, and significance, uh, what actually catalyzes an existential crisis in the first place? So basically, as a child, you're just fine with being up until you hit maybe your elementary school years or maybe a little bit further down the line, partway through elementary school. You're fine with things having no purpose. You know, it, everything, you're just discovering new things and that's enough to keep you by. However, as you get older, you start to learn to use the tools of significance, worth, and value to get what you want out of life. And what you want, really, underneath all other things, is happiness and fulfillment and expansion. And so, uh, basically, you become better and better and better at getting what you want, and everything becomes quite linear. It's like, oh, I want this because this is going to bring this and then I get this. And that's fairly simple when you're a child. However, as you get older, your, um, the number of stops you take between getting to where you want, they become more and more as you get bigger. So for example, if a child wants to be happy, it's pretty point A to point B. It's like, oh, I want a juice box. That makes me happy. I'll go for that. However, as you get older, let's say as you are an, a young adult, it's like, oh, I want to get a good job so that I can make good money, so that I can have a particular amount of status, so that I can be happy. So there, there's these like in-between stages that happen. And so in all this complexity and in all this trying to get to that happiness point, we actually forget that what we want in the first place is happiness. And we get lost in the what purpose does this serve me mindset. And once this mindset is sort of ground into us, we start to size up all our activities in terms of significance, meaning, purpose, and value. And so I can recall when I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, I remember going to a theme park. And I remember thinking, like, is this supposed to be fun? Like, what's, why is it even good to have fun? You know, what's the point of having fun? You know, and I started to go through this and, you know, it was like one of my first little touches of real existential crisis. I didn't have any fun at the, the theme park then because I just didn't see a point in it. And, you know, so essentially I had let my measuring tools sort of get in the way of my experience of reality. Now, of course, this is ironic because what we seek in all of our actions is to go toward positive emotions and away from negative emotions. And so, of course, fun has a purpose. Fun is what you're looking for. You're looking for positive emotions and not just fun. You're looking for emotional fulfillment, too. You know, so. Um, if you look underneath all desires, this really is the root of all desires because you think that whatever action you take is going to bring you to happiness. And so another thing that comes along with an existential crisis is avoiding the feeling of emptiness, discomfort with feeling empty. Now, when we're a child, we're okay with the emptiness of life because we don't recognize it as such because we see the reality underneath our frameworks and our concepts that we use to understand reality. So as we get older, we use more and more abstractions to interface with reality. And we realize when we're having an existential crisis at some level that those abstractions are not real. And so it's this kind of feeling like, oh, life is empty. I'm, I'm sort of living a lie. But also, if you recall that, that aliveness of being a child, like that feeling of what's underneath that framework is something magical. 
and it truly is something very, very magical to experience it. But the more we get older, we lose touch with that reality and our concepts sort of superimpose themselves over this reality. And so we want these things to be permanent. We want these things to have significance. But this feeling of emptiness, it, it sort of shows us that everything is ephemeral. And we usually meet that feeling of emptiness with resistance, with denial. And also, it's sort of like you start to realize that you're always right in the room with the Grim Reaper at any given time. It's kind of like the elephant in the room, like you go around the corner, you could die then. Uh, you walk out in the street, get hit by a bus, or maybe you get sick, or you know, a various number of things could happen. And you know that eventually one day that you will die. And so this is why people avoid that feeling of emptiness, because that feeling of emptiness reminds us of our ephemeral nature, of the fact that it could happen at any moment. To the small self, to the ego mind, what death means is total annihilation. And of course, total annihilation is terrifying. And so the primary reason why an existential crisis is a crisis is simply because we are not at peace with death. We're not at peace with the fact that we'll die one day. And so the number one uh, challenge of being in an existential crisis is how to be more at peace with death. Now the ways that people typically cope with this are really sort of like band-aids on the wound, like someone might distract themselves or try to convince themselves that they're invincible in some way. Um, or they might join some kind of group, like a religious group or an ideological group or some other place where they can find significance within that group. Or maybe they try to leave a legacy uh, where, you know, they can hopefully be remembered for years and years after their death. And so that's what the way people typically deal with this issue of the inevitability of death. But this isn't truly making peace with the fact that you'll one day die and be forgotten. But how is it possible to truly be at peace with the inevitability of death? Well, the first thing is to truly let the monster that is emptiness eat you up. So if it's the monster that's been lurking under your bed, you have to dangle your feet right off the bed and let it drag you under there and chew you up because what it chews up is it chews up your illusions. And delusions are what cause all of this suffering in the first place. If you were aware enough, there would be no struggle, there would be no crisis here. And so when you have an existential crisis, it is a way for you to expand and to purge yourself of the delusions. And emptiness helps you do this. So do this by whenever that feeling of emptiness comes up, don't try to make yourself feel better. Don't try to distract yourself. Just focus on the body sensation that, um, that that emotion gives. Where do you feel the emptiness? Just focus on that. Don't try to change it or make it something else or make yourself feel better. Just sit with that emotion. Now this might seem paradoxical because you're used to doing things to make yourself happier. And you might think, well, why would I do that if that's going to make me less happy now? But it's almost sort of like giving birth to a new self. You know, the emptiness really does chew up your delusions and you come out as a completely new person if you can expand enough to deal with that. And so even though you might be looking for happiness, this is like a short range view of happiness. You need to look on the long range. And so avoiding that feeling of emptiness will make you feel more miserable. But if you let it hit you, then you'll become more and more able to handle that. And you'll become more and more aware. And as you become more and more aware, death becomes less and less threatening because you start to see it in a different perspective. Another way to become more at peace uh, with death is to really go full force into seeking truth. So basically, you want to debunk as many illusions as possible. And basically, everything that's an illusion is a thought. And so you want to really become clear about what's a thought, what's a belief, and what is reality itself. And then just observe reality itself. See what you find. And you'll find that everything is constantly in flux. Every moment is a new birth and a new death. Now, existential crisis normally works in a spiral effect. So you'll have an existential crisis and you'll expand from that and you'll keep spiraling up and up and up. So you'll probably run into many existential crises on the path of growing your consciousness. And so existential crisis is for the sake of busting through delusions at deeper and deeper levels. 
Another important practice for becoming at peace with death and dealing with your existential crisis is to do self-inquiry and inquiries into reality. So ask yourself, what's perceiving all of the experiences that I'm perceiving? Where are they coming from? Where are they going? Where is the self that will one day die? Look for that self. You'll find that it's not, uh, well, I won't spoil it, but look around for it. Try to find it in your firsthand experience. Like, what uh, is it in your, is it in your head? Is it a soul? Is it your body? Like, what is it that actually dies when you die? Also, get present to what's really lost in death. Like, so we lose the present moment, our consciousness of what's here right now. Now, we have various attachments to people and to places and to things that we would typically do. But if you think about it, everything's constantly in flux. You've never perceived an identical moment. And so every moment is a new death. And so the ultimate death in our life isn't much different from that. So it's important to inquire into reality and to do so with an incredibly open mind and the willingness to feel uncomfortable emotions. And I think that's maybe the number one thing. You have to be willing to feel the uncomfortable emotions to really allow the fire of the existential crisis to burn away all of your delusions. Also, there are things to avoid when you're in an existential crisis. Of course, don't throw your life in the toilet because you decide that it's meaningless. You know, don't decide to kill yourself because life doesn't have any inherent meaning. Avoid these negative behaviors, but let the emotions fully hit you like, without resistance, without making up a story about how they're wrong and bad to have and to feel. Also, above all, know that everything is okay. Even if you don't see it right now, beyond the concerns of the ego, everything is absolutely fine and there is complete peace. The only thing that causes your suffering is lack of awareness and awareness can be cultivated. So when you're able to transcend the need for the small self to continue and perpetuate through forever, and you start to uh, see the ephemeral nature of all of reality and how you truly fit in with that. You know, these, me these meanings of significance and value and insignificance and worth and worthlessness, all of those things, I will, you'll just see them for what they are, something that's not real, something that's just a measuring tool. And you will become at peace with death if you dig far enough into this. All right, so that's all I have for you today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead, click the like button below and subscribe. Also, check out my blog at The Diamond Net. I'm gonna start writing in that soon. Uh, so you definitely wanna check that out. Um, other than that, that's all I have for you. And until next time, keep becoming more you. Mm -hmm.